welcome you back tonight and welcome you if you're visiting especially. Will you listen with me about this lesson tonight? This is a lesson about repentance as I announced this morning. And let's back up for a moment and remember that at least twice in the scriptures and implied many more times than that, God spoke of His interest in everybody being saved. That it was not His desire that anyone be lost. One is in the Old Testament and another in the New. In Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 23, God said, Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? It doesn't make God happy to see a wicked person die in their sins. Rather, God says, He would like to see that person turn from their ways and come back to Him. Then they would live in His sight. In 2 Peter 3 verse 9, talking about the coming of the Lord, one of the things He said was, that the Lord is not slack concerning His promises as some would count slackness. In other words, the, the day of the Lord's coming, and it's not delaying because God's just slow, or that God uh, won't, hasn't gotten around to it yet, but instead God is long-suffering towards us. Now, now listen to what He says. God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's God's will that nobody end up like that because of the implications of it, I'm sure, and, and because of the lostness of their situation. And in both of those scriptures, you notice something, and that it implies the need for repentance. As he talks about God's desire for people to be saved, he emphasizes he wants people to turn from their ways. God wants people to come to repentance. So repentance is really a big part of the will of God. When you study repentance, you have to study it, from two different perspectives. You have to talk about it as part of the original gospel message that we hear in order to be saved. And then we have to talk about how it applies to our lives as Christians and, and when it's needed and when it's necessary. But let's start with that first part. A necessary part of the gospel message. That if you're going to preach the gospel, you're going to be preaching repentance to people. You'll be asking and calling upon them to repent. It's kind of interesting... From the earliest days, as the gospel began to unfold, Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, and Jesus is going out, and even John is going out and saying these things, but the message was to repent. It was about the coming of the kingdom of God. It was on the verge of being established, but in order to be ready for that, repent was the watchword for it all. Jesus, after he took, you know, from the ministry of John, and John the Baptist had been in prison, Jesus began preaching and said from that time, talking about the time of John's imprisonment, Jesus began to preach that same message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Also in Mark 6 verse 12, they went out, it says, and preached that people should repent, that that was going to be a necessary thing for all mankind to accomplish in order to please God. In Luke chapter 24, as Jesus reviewed the message and talked about what needed to be preached and also what was the responsibility of man, listen to this, this would be, this would be kind of the, the way that Luke phrases the Great Commission and uh, it, it includes a part of the plan. Uh, other accounts like in Mark 16, 16 talks about belief and baptism here it talks about repentance, but in this verse he talks, says this, Thus it is written, and this is Jesus talking, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. So he's saying, when he says it's written, he's talking about in the Old Testament, they were told that Jesus Christ would come, he would die, he would rise again on the third day. Also, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins is the message that should be, should be proclaimed in His name to all the nations starting there at the city of Jerusalem. That coordinates pretty good with the book of Acts. But when you go to the book of Acts, you know Luke wrote Luke and Luke wrote Acts as well. But when you go over to the book of Acts, you find what they preached was that repentance. Peter said to them, now back up for a minute, why did he have to say anything to them? Well, he has been preaching... Just what we read a minute ago. He's been preaching that Jesus had to die, He had to be buried, He had to be raised from the dead, and that this message should be preached. And, and so that's exactly what Peter's been preaching before this verse arrives. And we always want to remember, this is a response. What did 
What did the crowd say that made Peter say, repent? And the, the, the answer to that is, they said, what do we need to do? What must we do? What would you say if somebody had just stood up and said, you've been guilty of bringing about the death of the Son of God? And they're pricked in their hearts, and they said, what should we do? And the answer to that question was inclusive of repentance, but it was not just repentance. Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, some versions say the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Later, Peter would be up preaching this. And by the way, this is a fact. It's recently kind of come up with some of our Christians here in, in talking with other people. But here's something to remember. Sometimes, as the Bible is going along, it will talk more exclusively about one of these commands. All right? Then we're going to go over to Acts chapter 3, where Peter preaches his next sermon. Doesn't talk about faith. Doesn't talk about baptism. Doesn't talk about confessing Christ. But there it talks about repentance. There's something we need to realize about that. Not every text covers every detail. We need to take the whole of God's Word and put it all together and realize all this coordinates well together and fits together. On this day, Peter said you need to repent and be converted so that your sins may be blotted out. Reading that plainly, by the way, in your mind, do you understand that all of these things that he's talked about, your faith, your repentance, your baptism, do you see clearly in those scriptures that all of that came before salvation? Can you read that scripture, for instance, tonight and see that he's saying you must repent and be converted so that your sins can be blotted out? This is something that's uh, batted around, discussed, and disagreed with by some people that preach and teach in, in the name of Jesus Christ. Some say belief is only necessary, but repentance and confession and baptism are not necessary. Some eliminate, uh, you know, they eliminate baptism out of the story. Some eliminate repentance out of the story. But what we need to understand, all these scriptures are saying before you, our last one taught us repent and be baptized. This one says repent, but we still see the same cohesive message in the sense that he's saying you need to repent for your sins to be blotted out. If they repented, the next logical step would be for them to confess Christ and to be baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. Repentance is that part of the gospel. And that's just what we're giving emphasis to tonight, not to the exclusion of the other commands. You know, this was such a consistent message that they preached that some of these early statements, you know, like on the day of Pentecost, that was the Jews, and then in Acts chapter 3, that was still the Jews. But in this scripture, Paul has gone to the city of Athens. Do you remember how that happened and what went down, that Paul saw a city full of idolatry? These were Gentiles Paul talked to. Because Paul stood in the marketplace and talked to people about Christ and the resurrection of the dead and things like that, these philosopher types went and asked Paul, can you come talk to us about this? We don't understand what you're talking about. They took him to a place where they debated things like that. And uh, most of our Bibles are pretty more familiar with the term Mars Hill. And some versions say Areopagus, but Areopagus means Mars Hill and just to in the Greek language, so it's still the same idea. Mars Hill, this is a spot. It's not a fancy spot. As I understand it, it wasn't a fancy spot back then. It was kind of an outcropping of rock that stood up high in the area, and it was flat, and you could go up to it, and you could talk and visit and kind of have a little peace out there to yourself. One of the things that Paul tells these people, now, these are Gentiles, these aren't Jews, but look how consistent the message is. The... Truly, these times of ignorance, God has overlooked. What he's saying is that you've been very idolatrous in days gone by, but this is a time period that God didn't ever send a special representative to you and said, you, you, you need to stop your idolatry. God has overlooked that for a long time. Not that God justified their immorality, just that God didn't call them into question about it. That time God has overlooked, but now, listen to that now, now 
A new age has come for Jew and Gentile. And now God calls all men everywhere, Jew, Gentile, every background of mankind, He calls upon them to repent. Do you, you ever think about the implications of that statement? Every person is supposed to repent. All men everywhere, you can't get more inclusive than that. And men is not male there, men is mankind. All mankind everywhere, God is calling upon them to repent. This would, that's why Jesus said this, go into all nations of the earth, it will be for everyone. You see that more clearly in Acts 20, 21, where he says that Paul was testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks of repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. That repentance needed to happen. It was a necessary part of your obedience to God if you're going to obey the gospel message. But, and this is sometimes confusing to people that don't really study their Bibles well or understand it well, there is a part of repentance that applies to you and me once we become Christians. We obey that gospel. We have repented of our sins in days gone by. We have made the necessary changes in our lives that repentance requires. So repentance has happened, and yet, what happens in our lives sometimes? Well, it's a shame to say, but sometimes we do things that aren't right. And when we do that, God calls upon us to repent again. God asks us to repent. Now let's talk about a case of this in Acts chapter 8. This is the story of Simon the sorcerer. Simon the sorcerer is an impressive, important part of that story. Matter of fact, one of the most dynamic chapters of the Bible is Acts 8 because all kind of stuff is going on. Number one, they go up to the village of the Samaritans and start preaching and they start obeying the gospel. Philip is one of those men that goes up there and preaches to them and he's obeying the very thing Jesus did. Take it to all nations. Go out there and preach it. So he's gone out there and preaching to these Samaritans and they're becoming obedient and it says that they believed what he preached concerning Jesus and the kingdom of God, and that they were baptized. And then it includes in that bunch a, a man that had been a sorcerer. Now, if you're familiar with your Old Testament, sorcery was always on the list, both in Old and New Testaments, of a list of sins that God said, you know, are, are forbidden and wrong and, and evil. And uh, it's, it's kind of a second cousin to idolatry as far as its implications. Sorcery was always wrong in God's sight. So here is Simon the Sorcerer. Simon the Sorcerer is a popular fellow among their society. It says that and talks about how he had done his seemingly magical arts and people referred to Simon the Sorcerer as the great power of God. They thought he was something special. And it, it seems like maybe he tried to make it sound like he was speaking for God or doing things in the name of God. I don't know all about that. I just know that they thought he was something great in the sight of God. But it says that when, and this is so impressive to me, when Simon the sorcerer sees what the apostles do, Simon's thinking, that's not a trick. I do tricks. I'm a sorcerer. I pull stunts and I, I just know how to manipulate people. And he's sitting there thinking, but I don't know how to do what they're doing. And he, it's not like he just simply says, well, I want, I want to be able to do more tricks. That's not it. He believes that these men are actually doing something from God. I believe in his heart, Simon the sorcerer is thinking, I don't do anything that comes from God. I pull the wool over people's eyes. But these men really do. And it says that Simon also believed. And you can't get around this, by the way. Simon believed. Simon was baptized. Simon was convinced of what was right. He has turned to Christ. He believes in Christ. But if you know the story, what he did was, he decided it would be a great idea to offer the apostles money to get that power to be able to lay hands on people and impart miraculous things. And so he made the financial offer. I'll give you money if you'll give me that gift. Well, if any of you have ever dreaded the preacher coming to your house and saying, boy, I've got to talk to you about something, you ought to have heard Peter talk. Peter's going to be really, really 
bold compared to Pat Jones. Probably I'd sit down and talk real gently with you. That's what Peter said. You repent of your wickedness, of this wickedness of yours, and you pray that the Lord, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. <laughs> That's pretty stout stuff. And I guess if we went to do that to many people's house, they'd probably go run in themselves. Yet Peter thought this was very important to say. And the simple truth is Simon had let his heart be drawn to the wrong things. And it kind of was a little bit of a leftover from his previous ways. And he's talking like an unsaved person, you might say. But don't, don't make any mistakes about this. Simon the sorcerer believed and was baptized. And it says that, and it never says it was just a, you know, he was just faking it or anything. But what was Simon the sorcerer told to do? Now, I've had people before say, well, if you believe in baptism, then you would believe when a Christian sins, they have to be baptized all over again. I don't believe that. There's no reason to be baptized all over again. What was Peter told? Oh, I'm sorry, what did Peter tell Simon the sorcerer here? He told him to repent. And this is uniform for anybody that's a fallen Christian or has strayed into sin as a Christian. Our job is to repent. Repent of this wickedness. You know, I, I think about this, and I think about this case, and you may think, eh, all this repentance stuff tonight, that doesn't have that much applying to me because I don't do all that much wrong. I'm trying to be a good person and all of that. You don't have to go commit adultery or rob a bank to need to repent. Sometimes repentance is an attitude problem. This man that's talking about, most of what's wrong is his heart. His heart's in the wrong place. His mind's in the wrong place. He's thinking wrong about things. And Peter's pretty hard on him. But the simple truth is, he needed to know what kind of danger this was putting him in. And, and Peter, you know, the way he expresses it is not usually the way I would express it. Maybe I'm the one wrong. But Peter says, you need to repent if it's just possible maybe that the Lord might forgive you this sin. That's not how we typically say it, is it? But that's what Peter said. It may be that Peter so suspects Simon the sorcerer has his heart so misaligned with the will of God, it may be that, that he thinks, I just don't know if you're going to shape up and think right. That may be why he says it this way. To speak of the good news, Simon the sorcerer said, please pray for me that this won't come upon me. Please, please pray that this won't happen to me. So Simon did express great repentance in that regard. Well, let me tell you something else. Think again about children of God sometimes that need to repent. We all know the book of Revelation, and we know about the seven churches of Asia. In the opening two chapters, well, two, second and third chapter, rather, of the book of Revelation, these seven churches that Jesus Christ, not, not just God, not just uh, the Holy Spirit sending a message to an apostle, but Jesus spoke to each one of these churches by way of this written revelation. And it's impressive the way you begin to go through these churches and look what's said. We'll just do a sampling of this. Like in Revelation 2.7, the church of Ephesus was told, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and I will remove that lampstand from its place unless you repent. Think about that. Here is a church. Here is God's people. It is in a city. There has been an epistle written to that church in which very little wrong was told about what that church did. But now some years later, Jesus is addressing that church and saying to its members, you need to repent. You are not doing what you used to do. You don't act the way you did when you first became a Christian. You don't look at things the same way. It's time to repent and go back to where you were. Or up here 
to, the, to another congregation of His people. He speaks and He says in chapter 2 verse 16, Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Who would dread the thought of Jesus doing that to his, one of His churches? Or again in Revelation 2.22, Indeed, I will cast her, talking about a Jezebel in the church, I will cast her into a sickbed and all those who have committed adultery with her into a great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. He speaks again, the Lord Jesus does, and He says in Revelation 3.3, 3, Remember therefore how you have received and heard, hold fast, and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. He speaks again, Revelation chapter 3 at verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Think about that. Think about all these churches that Jesus had, say, had to say to them, you need to repent. It's it kind of implied some there in some of the verses and in some of the other verses, Letters to these churches, it sounded like pretty much the whole church needed to shape up. But it shows us all that we're God's children, we're the church, we're the church of Christ, we're God's people, and we ought to look at it that way, and we want to be that. But look at what happens over the course of time. We get drifting into ways that aren't good, and God has to call us to repentance. And the head of the church, Jesus Christ, says, you need to repent and come back to where you were. Now, when he's saying that, what's he saying that we've got to do? Because I, here's one thing I a little bit fear. Sometimes repentance implies certain, certain things to certain people. Sometimes it means to some people, well, I've got, to, I've got to walk down an aisle and I've got to cry and I've got to, you know, apologize to everybody and, and all of that. And that might be what you need to do. It just it, it might do depends on what kind of circumstance you're in and what's gone wrong. But that's not always the whole story. And we need to look at, let's talk for a minute about a definition of repentance. The word itself is just a tiny bit, you know, vague. But it, it conveys the idea, if you look at it there, and I'm giving you the literal definition. Sometimes literal definitions in the Bible are, are a little bit confusing because you're just taking two Greek words, put them side by side, and trying to figure out what all that means. Well, here, it conveys the idea of perceiving something afterwards. There's two parts to the word. Perceive it afterwards. But what that came to suggest, it implies a change. Something's happened, but now I've perceived things a different way, and I feel like I need to do differently. So afterwards, I've decided to make a change. I've decided to do differently about that. So you kind of see where the terminology is going. And so change and the idea of after and to come to a perception that helps you get there. To repent, you're going to have to change your mind and then you're going to have to change your actions in order to make it all happen. And so... In Vines, for instance, it has a really good expository dictionary of Bible words. He says, well, that means that if you put all this together, it means to change one's mind or purpose. And he says, always in the New Testament, the word would imply a change for the better. That you're changing from something worthless to something good, something harmful to something that's valuable instead. So that's the concept. Repentance kind of has various parts as the scripture explains it. So let's start with a little look at it in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, a pretty important passage to go to. Verses 9 through 10, look at that verse with me. He says, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led you to repentance. Okay, think about that for a moment. And <clears throat> there's different questions about this, but this is the second epistle to the Corinthians. Paul had been pretty hard on them in the first epistle and he was somewhat hard on them in the second epistle. But he said, my goal really wasn't to make you sorry, like to depress you or make you upset or hurt your feelings or whatever. That's not my goal. My goal was to create in you a sorrow for your sin so that you'd want to repent. That a sorrow that would lead you to repentance. 
And he said, you were made sorry, but it was made sorry in a godly manner. And you, you know, I, I, sometimes we do when we try to help people and get them out of their sins, we do upset them. But that's the goal, to make people sorry in a godly manner. To make them think about their sins and think about the implications of what that means for their life. Paul says, I'm doing this, I don't want you to suffer loss, I don't want you to lose your soul, I don't want you to you know, waste your time in serving the Lord, I want you to be what you need to be. Then he says this, it's probably the most familiar part, godly sorrow, for godly sorrow produces repentance. A repentance that leads to salvation. And a repentance we won't have any reason to ever regret. But there's another sorrow. It's the sorrow of the world. And he says, that's not going to do you any good whatsoever. Hmm. That sorrow produces death. Godly sorrow produces repentance. Worldly sorrow leaves you in your sins and produces death. So I would think, number one, if that's the first stage, we better hone in on what's good godly sorrow, shouldn't we? How are we going to be benefited if I'm just... So, you know, okay, think about this for a moment then, what, what that would mean. That would mean that I have to be real careful in repentance that I'm motivated for the right reason. So, let's say I've done something wrong, I get caught, people come down on me, I'm, I'm kind of all upset and everything about it. Somebody comes to me and talks to me, and I said, okay, I'll straighten this up. What's going on in your heart at that moment? Are you sorry that you've offended God? Are you sorry that you hurt his cause? Are you sorry that it's been a, you know, a blemish on the church? Are you sorry that you've hurt your family? Are you sorry you got caught? Are you sorry that's just going to be consequences for this? And if you know, sometimes sin do carry, sins do carry consequences. But if all I'm on is sorry that there's going to be a consequence, or sorry that I got caught, or sorry that I'm embarrassed now, if that's all this is, that's not godly sorrow. Godly sorrow works on me to repent. Godly sorrow will sooner or later produce the repentance that will lead back to my salvation, to be being saved. If you graft it, I guess it would look like that. Godly sorrow produces this. So if you think about the order of things, godly sorrow works on my mind to change my mind about my status with God and how I'm treating God and His cause and all of that. But there's another stage to this, and that is this indeed needs to lead my life to change. What good would it be for me to be sorry, but nothing changes I don't do anything different. I keep doing the same old thing. I think we all know, you know, marriage partners can look at each other and do things that hurt each other's feelings. I'm sorry, but if you're going to do it tomorrow and the next day and the next day, all the sorries in the world probably not going to help a whole lot, is it? God wants more than just I'm sorry. He wants repentance, and that changes your mind. It leads then to a change of life. Now, how, how can I prove that? Well, re- true repentance does. It produces a change in the, the way you act. So think of those three stages. Number one, I'm truly sorry that I've done this. I, I, I'm sorrowful that I, I've, I've hurt God and I, I've broken the laws of God and, and I've done disgrace to the cause of God. That's the first stage. And then I, that makes me change my mind and alter the way I'm thinking about things. And then it ought to start changing my life. Now listen to what, I believe this is John the Baptist, if I remember correctly, in Matthew 3, verse 8, talking. And people would come down to be baptized of John, and they were supposed to be repenting as they did that. And John said to them, well, you need to bear fruits in keeping with your repentance. So you coming down being baptized or or, or saying you're sorry for your sins, or saying I repent of my sins, but if you're going to do that, there ought to be a fruit I could see as the result of that, that you wouldn't go on in that same sin. For instance, when they preached in, in Acts chapter 26, verse 20, it says that they said they should repent and turn to God. 
and do the works that befit or fit the concept of repentance. If I really change my mind, I'm not going to keep going in the same old works, so I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to change my activity and do the works that coordinate and go with that. You keep thinking about this. For instance, we read, Jesus told about it, but it happened in Old Testament times. It said that Nineveh repented at the preaching that Jonah did. They repented. Well, what did that mean? They turned every man from his evil way. That's what they did if they truly repented. They went against what they had been doing. They lived a different way. In Acts chapter 14, verse 15, it says, Men, why are you doing these things? They were, they were actually sacrificing there in front of Paul and Barnabas and acting like they were gods. And Paul and Barnabas were you know, horrified by this. And they said, Why are you doing these things? We are men. We are men of the same nature as you are. We're not any different. We're, we're fellow human beings. We don't deserve any worship. We don't deserve any glory. We are preaching the gospel in order that, listen to him now, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. That should change. What it was going to mean for these people is, yeah, I know all your life you've gone to a temple and worshipped these false gods. All your life you've served Zeus and Mercury and and Diana and all these different gods, you're not going to do that anymore. You're going to give that up and turn to a living God because that's the God that made the earth and made the sea and made everything that's in them. That's the true God. So you turn to that living God and you start serving Him. Matter of fact, it says of the people of Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes about when the gospel came to them, what did they do? It says that... It's being reported out there. Of course, he already knew this. He was there. But he's saying out there, it's being, the message being spread at Thessalonica, what kind of reception we had with you. When we came to Thessalonica, Paul says, and preached to you, you turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God. You made a turnaround. And that was real repentance on their part. And it cost them something. And it caused things to begin to change. Let me, let me quickly say this. These things are not repentance. Just confessing your sin, that's not the whole story. It's a good thing to do, but it's not the whole of nature. You can confess a sin without really being sorry for it or, or uh, repenting. <laughs> this is something I've had an experience with before, but I've had somebody come down the aisle and they say, I'm, and they were out of duty with God, and we knew that. They came down the aisle, I thought, well, how wonderful. And I got them on the front seat and started talking, and they wanted to tell everything that ever happened. Not about their sin, but everything everybody did wrong to them and all the rest. And I'm thinking, well, that doesn't have anything to do with repentance. If you've come to repent, we don't need you to tell everything that's ever gone wrong. We've all had that in our lives. It really isn't just mere regret. You can regret things. Most of us usually do, in fact, when we sin, we have a degree of regret, but that's still not change. You can change sometime, but it's not because you're sorrowful. Not godly sorrow anyway. You could change for a lot of reasons. Sometimes people repent, and then they turn around and try to justify their sin in the first place. That's not the right thing to do. If you're repenting, you're abhorring what you did. That kind of sorrow is not a good kind of sorrow at all. Let, let's look at this verse and uh, talk about a few elements within this verse. I want you to see this. Now, we've talked already about the Corinthians. And this is that same context where he's talking about godly sorrow. So follow along with me. He says, when godly sorrow leads you to repentance. Okay, here's what's going to be produced. Look, look with me. Now, that's my words in Corinthians. Here's what it says. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, has produced in you. What should godly sorrow change if we've been guilty of sin? It ought to turn me from a person that's been very neglectful to a person that's very earnest about my responsibilities now. In other words, 
if I come down and say I'm wrong and I need to repent and I'm changing my ways, then we need to change our ways. If somebody comes down and tells me I'm going to do better and then nothing changes by the next week and it's all the same old thing, is that really repentance? Has anybody repented? There ought to be an earnestness about it that changes, that we're serious about this, in other words. What else? You need, at that point, to be vindicating yourself. Now, that's not done by me sitting around and saying, per me, I got caught in this trap of sin because this happened and that happened and that's why it all took... That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you need to start on a course after wrongdoing. All of us do. We need to start on a course of wrongdoing that somebody will look at our lives and say, well, I'll tell you something. They fell, but they have really changed in their ways. It ought to vindicate you in the future because... Somebody knows, okay, they sinned in the past, but they're serious about it now and they're trying to do what's right and they are vindicating themselves. Well, there ought to be now on your part an indignation. That means it's sort of an anger, a, a, a disappointment and a, and a frustration even. There ought to be that in regard to sin. No longer should you treat sin lightly, but you ought to have a certain indignation about it upset that such a thing ever happened and entered into your life. It ought to change your fear. I think all of us know we get into sin because we quit fearing the Lord like we should. But boy, that all ought to change if we're going to repent. Suddenly there should be a longing for the things of God, not an indifference about it all. There should be a new zeal for these things. My life, my heart should be zealous for the things of God now. I would want to avenge anything that's gone wrong in the process and make it right and do what's right. In fact, he said, now you're trying to demonstrate yourselves to be innocent in the whole matter. You're trying to turn things around, and that's a good thing in order to do. Well, I made the comment this morning about repentance, that that's a hard command to obey. And let me briefly say why that's so. We said for a non-Christian... Sometimes trying to get them to be baptized, it is hard. We all have that trouble and the disagreements about it. And somebody may say, well, that, that's what's so hard. Or maybe for a Christian, well, you know, you can't get them to confess their sins or whatever. But you know, repentance is the hardest of commands. And, and let me tell you why quickly. It's hard because repentance requires you to conquer you. The simple truth is you've got to win a battle against yourself, against your will, against your feelings. It's hard because it takes much humility. It's hard to say, I've been wrong, I've done wrong, and I've been engaging in things that don't please God. And it is hard because it involves you saying, you know, I'm wrong. I'm, I'm guilty here. Those three things are big things. Can I tell you one other thing, and I'll let the lesson wrap up, and that is the Scripture says something interesting, and that is God grants repentance. That's kind of part of God's grace, isn't it? God grants you the right to repent. Think about that for a moment. Just a couple of Scriptures on that. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, talks about our work in the kingdom. It says the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. You need to be kind to all. You need to be able to teach. and You need to be patient when wronged and with gentleness correcting those that are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. God grants repentance. God grants somebody the opportunity to repent. I believe we read this one already, but in Acts 11, this is about the household of Cornelius being saved. And when they reported this back in Jerusalem, some people questioned, why, Peter, were you in the house of a Gentile talking to Gentiles about the gospel? Peter explained everything that happened on that day. And it said, when they heard this, they quieted down, which in class they were pretty upset. They quieted down, and then they glorified God. And they said, well, then. God has granted the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. You know, 
Whether you're an alien sinner that's never obeyed the gospel that needs to tonight, or you are a Christian that has had to repent or is going to have to repent, no matter which case, one thing we all ought to bow our heads and say, thank you, Lord, that you've granted us repentance. That you didn't say, hey, sorry, it's over, you don't get a chance. But that God would say, I grant you the opportunity to repent of your sins, to make things right. God's granting that to you. You've got to listen to that language because that doesn't mean you deserve it. It means God has decided to allow you to repent and have the life that comes from being right with God. You see the two cases and you see what's necessary for the child of God and what's necessary for the person that's never obeyed the gospel. So we're going to sing our song of encouragement. How about standing at this time? Let's sing together. And if you need to make that response, you come while we stand and sing. Oh, do not let